All right, so we are going to go ahead and get started. So we can stay on time. We have a lot of great content to cover today and uh, want to leave plenty of time for discussion. So hello and welcome to the inaugural Helen Morris American Jewish Experience in Medicine program, Legacies of the American Jewish Health Community, Colorado's Leading Role in Treating Tuberculosis. I'm Malia Himber, I'm the Outreach Program Manager at the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities. We'd like to sincerely thank Dr. Helen Morris, whose generous gift made this new educational series possible as well as the Rocky Mountain Jewish Historical Society at the Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Denver for partnering with us on this event. I'd also like to thank David Weil and Utibi Etta at the center, along with our tech team behind the scenes and the American Jewish Planning Group, including Dr. Silvers, for all their hard work in planning and promoting today's events. A special thank you as well to all the health professionals, health professions students who may be in the audience today we do highly encourage you to share your thoughts and questions with us throughout the program. This program is being recorded and it will be posted to our website. Please use the Q&A button to submit questions. While we will not be able to answer all your questions, we do share your questions and comments with the speakers after the event. I will now hand the program over to Dr. Bill Silvers who will be introducing our moderator. Dr. Silvers is a clinical professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and a faculty affiliate in the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities. Thank you, Dr. Silvers. Thank you, Malaya. Um, so I thank you for, uh, it's my privilege to introduce Matt Winia, director of the CU Center for Bioethics and Humanities, professor of medicine, professor in the Colorado School of Public Health, and really a foremost leader in bioethics in America formerly with the AMA, initiating a division of patient engagement and ethics. He's past president of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, and has led other initiatives, including teaching Holocaust bioethics with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and now leading COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic ethics with the state of Colorado and nationally. When Dr. Helen Morris brought forth her desire to dedicate a program for what became this American Jewish experience in medicine, Matt was happy to put together a team to further this, including Mark Levine, chair of the community board of the Center for Bioethics Humanities, Malaya and myself and others. He said he would be happy to do this for other denominations and perspectives in ethics and medicine also, be they Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, et cetera to make the world a better place. So if anyone in the audience is uh, interested, there's room for more. A few words about Dr. Helen Morris. And if we have a slide previously uh, from 1981, I've known Helen since my fellowship days at National Jewish, doing research with her as she was exploring early chemical mediators of inflammation, such as SRSA, prostaglandins, and what became leukotrienes as they were being initially described. This is a picture that I had found uh, of a poster session at the American Academy of Allergy meeting in 1981 in Montreal. But while Helen was doing novel chemical analyses, it was my job to have the research subjects, mostly students and patients of a community uh, allergist, Dr. Jack Selner, set up for exercise testing and being sure to be supplied with donuts in the morning. So we each have a role to play in clinical and basic research. She's been a pioneer in allergy, endocrinology, and immunology, as well as for women in medicine, especially in Colorado. A Denver native, child of East European immigrants, graduate of the CU School of Medicine class of 1956, she's dedicated her philanthropy to the education of students and enlightenment of our Jewish and medical communities. It's a true privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Matt Winia and to recognize Helen Morris, both physicians dedicated to tikkun olam, repairing and healing the world. Thank you all very much. Bill, thank you so much. That was a very generous introduction and I love seeing your poster presentation. It just brings back memories of the days before PowerPoint. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it, it's, uh, 
it's amazing uh, how how the world has changed. And I think um, I'll, I'll start by saying, first off, I'm so proud um, that Helen trusted us to uh, to host this new program. Um, to me, this program is really in the sweet spot for what our center is intended to do, which is to blend the humanities and contemporary ethical and social issues in medicine. And um, of the fields of the humanities, the field of history is perhaps the one that is least often attended to in health sciences training programs. Um, and also arguably the most impactful in terms of its influence on the way that we think about ethical, legal, social, and other issues in the health sciences today. So the opportunity, you know, whenever I can find an opportunity to bring the, the influence of history to bear on contemporary implications from health and medicine, I like to do so. I, I really feel like this gift um, from Helen is, um, is perfect for us. And I hope that we are able to achieve what she wants us to achieve with this. Um, and with that as background, I'm gonna say, this will not be the last of these sessions. This is the first of these sessions. And in many ways, um, the historians on the panel today, we've had some conversations leading up to this. They're gonna cover a lot of ground. They're gonna touch on a lot of issues. And our intent today is to leave you hungry to learn more because there will be additional opportunities to explore the things that today we will probably just get a chance to touch on. So we're gonna start today uh, with Dr. Jeannie Abrams. Dr. Abrams is a professor at the University of Denver Libraries and Center for Judaic Studies, where she's also the director of the Rocky Mountain uh, Jewish Historical Society and curator of the Beck Archive Special Collections. She's the author of a number of fascinating books, A View from Abroad, which is the story of John and Abigail Adams in, when they were in Europe, First Ladies of the Republic, which looks at uh, Abigail Adams and Dolly Madison and Martha Washington and how they created the role of the first lady and revolutionary medicine, which is about uh, the founding fathers and mothers um, in sickness and in health in the United States. So she's gonna start us off today with, uh, with a talk about, uh, about the history of the treatment of patients um, by the Jewish community in Colorado and how that has influenced national um, level conversations and treatment plans and so on. We're gonna follow her rapidly with uh, Dr. Chuck Daly. Uh, Dr. Charles Daly is chief of the Division of Mycobacterial and Respiratory Infections at National Jewish Health. And he's a professor of medicine at National Jewish at the University of Colorado and also at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. He attended medical school at the University of Mississippi and did his residency, chief residency, and a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine at UCSF. As a member of the UCSF faculty, he really focused his work on TB, including HIV-related uh, multidrug-resistant TB at San Francisco General and also in Tanzania. But in 2004, he joined National Jewish, where his academic interests have continued to include TB and global health policy, as well as clinical and translation translational research projects. He has served on and chaired expert panels for the World Health Organization, the CDC, the IDSA, our Infectious Disease Society, the American Thoracic Society and others. And his work on global TB control was award, awarded the World Lung Health Award by the American Thoracic Society. And then finally, Dr. Tom Noel, Dr. Colorado, uh, Dr. Noel is an Emeritus Professor of History and Director of Public History, Preservation, and Colorado Studies at University of Colorado, Denver. He's a Colorado native. He completed his BA at the University of Denver and his MA and his PhD at CU Boulder, where his mother and his grandmother also did their graduate work. Um, he is author or co-author of 56 books. He is a longtime former Sunday columnist for the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. Also, I should say, a longtime friend of the Center for Bioethics and Humanities. He has been a regular presenter for us over many years. Um, he appeared for uh, a number of years on Channel 9 as Dr. Colorado. Um, he's been appointed the Colorado State Historian. 
uh, in 2018. And for 50 years of teaching at CU Denver and for his many uh, public service and community uh, and academic publications, he was awarded uh, the very prestigious University of Colorado Medal just this year, uh, 2022. Um, Jeannie, I'm gonna turn things over to you and look forward to your presentation and then to commentary on your presentation by Drs. Daly and Noel, and then we'll turn to the audience for uh, questions. Thank you, Matt. And I wanted to echo our gratitude to Helen Morris, Dr. Helen Morris for initiating this program and to especially thank Matt and Malia and Bill for all their assistance moving forward. While most people associate the growth of Colorado with the search for wealth following the discovery of gold in the Pikes Peak area in 1859, far fewer realize that even more of the state's residents arrived as health seekers. By 1925, perhaps as much as 60% of Colorado's population had migrated to the state either directly or indirectly for treatment of tuberculosis or other respiratory diseases. Moreover, moreover as early as 1900, about one third of the state's physicians had moved here because either they or a family member or friend had been afflicted with TB. Starting in earnest in the late 19th century and peaking in the early decades of the 20th century, men and women from a variety of religious and ethnic groups arrived in Colorado to chase the cure for tuberculosis. For example, while many early Jews migrated to Colorado to pursue economic opportunity, it was tuberculosis and the quest for health which had the greatest impact on the growth of the state's Jewish community and later brought a flood of East European Jewish immigrants to Denver at the turn of the century. Indeed, no portion of the American health frontier received greater nationwide publicity after the Civil War than Colorado. And by 1896, the state was being referred to flatteringly as the world's sanatorium. Tuberculosis transformed the Colorado and the larger American landscape through social and cultural influences that even extended far beyond the field of medicine alone. It not only helped shape public health policy and treatment, but also affected personal habits. From legal prohibitions against spitting and the length of women's skirts shortened to prevent the spread of germs to the design of homes that increasingly included the addition of a sleeping porch to maximize fresh air. For many decades, sanatoriums and tent colonies were highly visible landmarks in Colorado. Indeed, tuberculosis, especially in the American West, but even at Saranac Lake in the New York Adirondacks and in South Carolina became the source of a robust economy and perhaps nowhere, nowhere more so than in Colorado. Why did they come? Colorado is so healthy, a man has to be shot to start a burial ground, Greg, one early booster in the state's history. The Denver and the Rio Grande Railroad lured potential residents to the area with the claim that, quote, the invalid of the East with hollow eyes and shrunken faces could find a cure for all their illnesses in the salubrious and health-giving climate of the Rocky Mountain region. And as early as 1887, the Denver Chamber of Commerce declared that tuberculosis is, quote, generally cured and always benefited by permanent residents here. Often exaggerated statements like these encouraged hundreds and later thousands of men and women to flock to Denver and Colorado Springs to seek a, a remedy for tuberculosis or consumption as it was also commonly known. And it was the most dreaded disease of the era. In fact, 
Tuberculosis held the dubious distinction of being the leading cause of death in late 19th and early 20th century America. In the first years of the 20th century, 150,000 Americans died yearly due to DB, and 10 times that number were afflicted with the disease. What magic there was in that name, Colorado, we called Thomas Galbraith, a prominent journalist and tuberculosis victim who came to Denver in the early 1900s. He said, to my mind, it was truly El Dorado. I never for one moment doubted that I was to be well. For well-to-do consumptives, a space in a fine boarding house, hotel, or even an exclusive sanitarium like Craigmore in Colorado Springs, where patients came to dinner in gowns and tuxedos, was still a distinct possibility. But for tuberculosis victims doubly afflicted with both disease and poverty, the prospects were indeed bleak. Since neither state nor municipal hospitals were available to care for the many TB patients that poured into Denver at the time, it was up to religious and ethnic groups to provide assistance. And it was Colorado's tiny Jewish community numbering no more than 500 in the 1890s and motivated in part by the Jewish concept of tzedakah and responsibility to those in need, which would come to their aid with the opening of the National Jewish Hospital for Consumptives, generally referred to as NJH, in 1899, and then the Jewish Consumptives Relief Society, known as the JCRS, in 1904. Indeed, National Jewish Hospital pioneered the sanatorium movement in Denver. The two Jewish sanatoriums served as models for Lutheran Sanatorium, which opened in 1904 and catered to German immigrants, and Swedish Sanatorium, which followed in 1908 and served Swedish Protestant consumptives, and a host of other institutions for TB patients, including later the Fitzsimmons Army Hospital in Denver. And indeed, Denver's two TB, Jewish TB sanatoriums were copied um, throughout the United States and even in Canada. The two Jewish hospitals were founded based on a melding of Jewish traditional philanthropic values, as well as progressive era goals, which emphasized the ideal that upper class members of society should work for the common good and particularly aid the ill and impoverished. Francis Weisbard Jacobs pictured here, an early Denver Jewish member of the social elite was a leading force in the local tuberculosis crusade. Frances was a young bride of 20 in 1863 when she accompanied her new husband by covered wagon from Cincinnati to their first home in Central City, a burgeoning gold boom town located about 30 miles west of Denver in the Colorado Territory. In 1870, the Jacobs family relocated to nearby Denver, where the Bavarian-born Abraham became active in business and politics, and Francis became an icon in philanthropy. Influenced by progressive ethos of doing good, she founded Denver's first kindergarten for children of working mothers, and influenced by the progressive era emphasis on efficiency, in 1887, Mrs. Jacobs, along with the Protestant minister and a Catholic priest, organized a federation of Denver charities. It was the forerunner of the community chest, which in turn evolved into the National United Way, of which Francis is recognized as a co-founder. But it is in the field of tuberculosis treatment that Jacobs made her greatest contribution. Working with others in Denver's acculturated, largely upper middle class German Jewish community, Mrs. Jacobs was also the impetus behind the founding of National Jewish Hospital. Known as Denver's, quote, mother of charities for her pivotal role in philanthropy, 
Frances Jacobs made the treatment of tuberculosis victims her personal mission. In addition to visiting the sick and often paying for medicine and doctor's visits from her own funds, Mrs. Jacobs lobbied Denver's movers and shakers on behalf of consumptives. However, in this instance, her overtures were rebuffed as city boosters felt that indigent tuberculosis victims could blacken the Mile High City's image as a popular health resort. Jacobs then turned to the Jewish community, which rallied to establish a sanatorium. Denver's Jewish Hospital Organization was formally incorporated in 1890, and according to the Articles of Incorporation, the hospital would be managed and funded by the Jewish community, but it would, be non, it would have a non-sectarian admissions policy. Unfortunately, Mrs. Jacobs died tragically of pneumonia at an early age before the hospital could be opened, but it was initially named the Francis Jacobs Hospital in her honor. Don't know if you can see on this slide, if you can enlarge it, you can see that it says Francis Jacobs Hospital on the placard in front. Due to the panic of 1893, the empty building languished for a number of years. However, prominent Denver Jewish businessman, Louis Anfanger, a local and district president of B'nai B'rith, a men's philanthropic organization, was able to convince the National Fraternal Order to impose a modest tax on members, which enabled National Jewish to open in 1899. From the beginning, NJH treated patients from throughout the United States and sought financial support from predominantly wealthy donors across the nation. Following the opening of the hospital in 1899, Denver's mayor paid tribute to Mrs. Jacobs observing, quote, out of her efforts has grown an institution national in scope and dedicated to the humane and charitable work in which during her lifetime she so earnestly engaged. In 1900, when 10 portraits of pioneers were selected to be placed in the windows of the dome of the Colorado State Capitol building, Francis Jacobs was chosen as one of the small elite group and the only woman. Many of Denver's early pioneer physicians, mostly of German Jewish origin, became associated with NJH. For example, Dr. John Elsner, who in the 1870s founded Denver's first hospital with 29 patient beds, what is known today as Denver Health, was a proponent of the founding of National Jewish. And he became a member of the first advisory board. Women also became an integral part of the NJH operation. For example, Fer Seraphine Pisco first became associated with NJH as a traveling fundraiser in its early years. And in 1911, her success pivoted her into the central role of executive secretary or director as we would term it today. At the helm of NJH, Mrs. Pisco was probably one of the first women in the United States to assume the position of chief executive of a national institution. And she remained at the helm until she retired in 1937. In the absence of a magic bullet drug to treat early TB patients at the turn of the century, fresh air, nutritious food, rest and moderate exercise were the cornerstones of early tuberculosis therapy. And all four of the early Denver TB sanatoriums carefully followed that regimen. Milk and eggs were considered especially helpful. In 1900, the bill for eggs alone at NJH reached $240 for a single month, a considerable sum for the time. Raw eggs were considered especially nutritious and easily digestible. At the Nordrick Sanatorium in Colorado Springs, one patient later recalled, she was forced to consume 28 raw eggs a day as part of her treatment. 
neither National Jewish or the JCRS were that radical in terms of eggs, but patients usually had at least five or six raw eggs a day. National Jewish featured wards with large windows or sleeping porches like this one outside that you see at National Jewish. Um, future Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir's sister, Shana Korngold, who was a patient at NJH in 1907, recalled in her memoirs that even on the coldest nights did the sick ones well wrapped up sleep outside. Nearly 150 tuberculosis patients were treated in NJH's first year, and the numbers continued to grow as the years passed. From the first, NJH emphasized the goal of providing free service, and this was reiterated in its famous motto, which became, none may enter who can pay, none can pay who enter. While NGH provided state-of-the-art health services free of charge, it also followed strict rules and regulations. For NGH was a product of the progressive era emphasis on efficiency. Indeed, many progressives sought to apply business practices to many areas of life, including the running of hospitals. To this end, NGH followed a clear path. Generally, only patients with incipient or early stage tuberculosis were admitted for a limited stay of six months. In other words, they were hoping to receive the best value for their dollars by treating only those who they felt had a good chance for recovery. In the first annual report, NGH leaders declared, quote, our aim is to cure, not to provide a last home for incurables. Patients also had to demonstrate that they had to have sufficient funds to travel back to their home states once they improved so that they would not remain a drain on the Denver community. While National Jewish was formerly non-sectarian, for decades, the majority of early patients were, were um, Russian Jewish immigrants, many of whom who had contracted disease in East Coast urban sweatshops. In 1880, America's Jewish population was about 250,000, composed mainly of Jews from Central Europe. But between 1880 and 1925, this number was augmented by a massive immigration of about two and a half million Jews, largely from Eastern Europe. This migration was stimulated by a number of significant push and pull factors, including severe poverty, overt pogroms, and the religious and economic discrimination of Russian Jews as well as the popular image of America as the golden land of opportunity as the pull factor. This surge in the East European Jewish immigration to the United States posed a multifaceted challenge to the established German Jewish community throughout America, including Denver. As a group, these early German Jews had integrated well into the general population and many had achieved economic, political, and social success, which certainly occurred in Colorado. While they gave generously of their time and money to aid the newcomers, at the same time, the established German Jewish community sought to Americanize these co-religionists, whom they often perceived as a different type of immigrant, as many of the newcomers practiced traditional Judaism, spoke Yiddish, dressed in an old world manner, and sometimes even espoused radical socialist political views. To help the immigrants acculturate as quickly as possible, for example, National Jewish soon introduced classes in English and bookkeeping to help transform patients into what they considered productive American citizens. Because of National Jewish's strong emphasis on Americanizing and acculturating its immigrant patients, many of the East European Jews felt that their cultural and religious preferences were overlooked and that they were sometimes treated in a condescending manner and, it, 
and even at times in a cold, business-like and personal way. National Jewish also followed contemporary me um, medical wisdom and acknowledged, quote, healthy foods such as milk, meat, and eggs, and they were all served prominently. And in the first years, the National Jewish Hospital's medical director insisted milk and meat be served together at all meals, alienating many of the early patients who observed the kosher dietary laws. A National Jewish Hospital did not institute a kosher kitchen until 1923, and Seraphine Pisco helped make that happen as she tried to make the immigrant Jewish patients more comfortable. The increasing number of Eastern European Jews seeking a cure in Denver, as well as disagreements over some of National Jewish Hospital's policies, were crucial stimulants to the founding of a second Jewish tuberculosis sanatorium in Denver, the Jewish Consumptives Relief Society, or JCRS. In 1903, a group of 20 immigrant tradesmen, many of themselves afflicted with TB, met to form their own sanatorium, sanatorium and managed to raise a dollar and 10 cents between them. They were fortunate, however, that they were soon able to attract some of the more prominent Denver's, more prominent Denver East European Jews who had already made a highly successful transition to the new country, including local physician, Dr. Charles Spivak, a popular gastroenterologist, and Dr. Philip Hilkwitz, a noted pathologist. Determined to make the JCRS a comfortable environment for indigent Jewish immigrant consumptives, Dr. Hilkowitz often affirmed his goal of not allowing the JCRS to become, quote, a cold complexionless institution, which just happens to be inhabited by Hebrews, a thinly veiled criticism of national Jewish. And Spivak insisted that if a patient feels at home in the sanatorium, recovery is hastened. To this end, the JCRS instituted a kosher kitchen with a very ethnic uh, cuisine from the beginning, as well as the regular celebration of the Jewish Sabbath and holidays. In addition, JCRS medical policies were strongly influenced by Dr. Spivak, who at the age of 22 was forced to flee the Russian secret police in 1882 due to his radical socialist political views. In America, he became a very successful middle-class physician and very patriotic citizen, but some of the early political philosophy was applied to the running of the JCRS sanatorium. For example, he insisted that the JCRS be what he called a people's institution with its funds collected in dimes and quarters from working class contributions. Perhaps even more radically, he decried progressive era business practices when applied to the work of hospitals, which he termed charity of the head and not the heart. He declared that unlike National Jewish, the JCRS would admit patients in all stages of the disease, even those with very advanced TB, because they were the most in need of help. And in many ways, he worked as, I would say, a nascent social worker and very forward in his ideas about making people comfortable in an environment that would help hasten their recovery, as he put it. For many years, the relationship between NJH and the JCRS was acrimonious with leaders disagreeing about medical issues and religious and administrative policies. In 1904, in an editorial in the Denver Jewish Outlook, Rabbi Friedman of Temple Emanuel, who was also a founder of NJH, criticized the JCRS for its liberal admissions policy and maintained, quote, the appeal of the JCRS extends an open invitation to the Jewish communities of the United States to send their penniless consumptives to Colorado. The society cannot possibly benefit the incurable consumptive and is a dangerous menace to Colorado. 
There was more than a grain of truth in Friedman's criticism. Colorado was indeed deluged with indigent consumptives from every religious and ethnic group who frequently spent the last of their savings for one more chance for life. Despite philosophical differences, daily life for the patients at both the JCRS and National Jewish, as well as Lutheran and Swedish, were very similar. And all four incorporated the common emphasis on fresh air, mild exercise alternated with rest and a rich diet. Early JCRS patients were housed in tent cottages to maximize their exposure to fresh air. The sanatorium, the JCRS sanatorium also featured an on-site dairy farm providing patients with fresh milk and eggs daily. And I should also mention that National Jewish um, was connected to the Schoenberg farms um, that were a number of miles away, but also provided fresh poultry, milk and eggs to patients almost daily. As time passed, the relationship between the two Jewish run hospitals became more amiable and even Rabbi Friedman became appreciative of the work of the, that the work of the JCRS and the work that it carried out. Both the established German Jewish community and the East European immigrants themselves managed to find funding and accommodations for many cured patients. And a significant number remained in Denver and Colorado to go on to become productive citizens, swelling Denver's West Side immigrant Jewish community, and then frequently moving to the East Side of town as they found success in growing businesses and professions. It is clear that the development of Colorado's Jewish population would not have occurred without the existence of National Jewish and the JCRS, and a number of Lutheran and Swedish sanatorium form of patients also settle in Colorado, all of these contributing to the population growth of Colorado. Although the Denver German and Eastern European Jewish communities often clashed over TB care in the early years, they were united in providing assistance, quote, for a child's sake. What became the motto for a new organization led by Jewish immigrants, Fanny Lorber and Bessie Willens and their friends. Although the two women were not health professionals, their dedication and business acumen provided the leadership for what became a medical institution with national impact. The Denver Sheltering Home for Jewish Children was founded in 1907 to provide free care for Jewish children of tuberculosis victims. It received support from all segments of the Jewish community and provided a stable and nurturing environment for children whose parents were too ill to care for them temporarily so they could continue their education and grow up in a Jewish environment. I should insert parenthetically, um, there was a great concern at the time. Some of those children were taken into Protestant or Catholic orphanages, and um, many of the uh, members of the Jewish community were very concerned about the proselytizing effects there. Fanny and Bessie traveled in a horse and buggy when they started out to solicit funds door to door. The Denver sheltering home later involved into a major orphanage, although most of the children had at least one parent and often two. And then it evolved to a treatment facility for children suffering from uh, respiratory diseases and was renamed the National Home for Jewish Children. In 1957, it became the world-renowned non-sectarian Children's Asthma Research Institute and Hospital Cary. And in 1973, it was renamed the National Asthma Center, NAC, and then merged with National Jewish Hospital in 1978. Bessie, William, excuse me, Bessie Willens later maintained in her heavily Yiddish accented English that she had made Mrs. Lorber for president. Fanny remained head of the home from 1907 until her death in 1957 for 50 years. The home and later asthma centers became national models for treatment. 
They were ahead of their time in so many ways and housed children in group homes with house parents to make, to make them feel more comfortable. Innovative groundbreaking treatment allowed thousands of asthmatic children with formerly intractable cases from across America to ultimately return to productive lives. And really Carrie and NAC really only um, allowed children who um, were considered incurable and they had a great success with a combination, not only of medical treatment, but um, what we would call kind of a holistic treatment that involved social workers and psychologists. Over 50% of the children who um, were considered incurable went back to regular Their lives without. Fanny Lorber, I should also add, was able to establish an office in New York City and the women's auxiliary around the country that she oversaw during her lifetime boasted more than 120,000 members. Um, I just want to say this picture is especially interesting. Here's three girls who were at the asthma center at NAC um, playing ba uh, basketball, and they were um, actually, um, this was a fundraiser. Before NAC treatment, many of these children had been afraid to indulge in any exercise, were frightened to eat almost any foods, and gradually with treatment here, which usually lasted between a year and a year and a half in which they were separated from their families, they were able to recover. And again, many, many went on to really um, uh, continue with productive lives. Although the demographic character of immigrants to Colorado changed over the years, the powerful lure of the popular image of the American West as a region of unprecedented opportunity remained constant. As Rabbi Friedman once observed, Quote, the fame of Colorado's capital city, nesting in a valley flooded with sunshine, protect, protected from extreme heat and cold, attracted not only the ambitious seeker of wealth, but the enfeebled seeker of health. No wonder Colorado was the land of promise towards which tens of thousands turned their faces. But whether they came in search of wealth or health or a combination of the two, a significant number of cured consumptives and people with asthma contributed to Colorado's development. Jewish citizens of Colorado in particular joined other ethnic and religious groups to leave an indelible mark on the growth of the state, especially in the areas of medicine and philanthropy. And the two early TB sanatoriums the Jewish community created earned national reputations, even international reputations for their valiant leadership in the American tuberculosis crusade. Today, National Jewish remains the leading American treatment center for respiratory illnesses and immunology. And the JCRS became the AMC Cancer Research Center, which eventually merged with the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. The influence of the Colorado Jewish medical community for well over a century has extended across the United States on multiple levels. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. That was, um, that was just amazing. Uh, I have a half a dozen questions I wanna ask you. And um, we're missing one of our panelists, so we may get a chance to go through all of the questions we've got. But first, I'm gonna turn directly to Dr. Tom Noel, Dr. Colorado, for his comments on your uh, discussion today. And then we'll come back to do Q&A in just a few minutes. Thanks. Dr. Noel. Well, thank you. It's a great honor and pleasure to be involved with the National Jewish Experience in Medicine. I can remember working with the wonderful Dr. Henry Clayman. I think set up the ancestor, I guess, of this program. And it's always a pleasure to, to read or to hear from Jeannie. Jeannie, I always learn when I'm in a room with you or reading one of your works. I particularly like your biography of Dr. Spivak, where you made the point in there. And again, now, 
that he was not only a, a caregiver, but also a great scholar in medical and medical and invented a lot of treatments for TB patients. I think one of the biggest themes that I can see in American Jewish experience is how well uh, Jews and Gentiles got on together, which as you all know, is not always the case in, in many communities. When you think of how Rabbi Friedman would work with uh, Myron Reed, the head of the Congregational Church here, and uh, Father O'Brien of St. Leo's Church, and uh, with Dean Martin Hart of St. John's Episcopal Church that, to work together to make these things happen. And I think from the very beginning with people like Dr. Elsner, who founded what's now Denver Health back in 1870 as the county hospital, he was not working just with Jews, he was working for the whole community. And uh, David, I don't know if you want to do questions now, or I should run down a list of thoughts or what? What's your pleasure? I'm happy to jump into some questions if, uh, if that's all the comments you wanted to make in response. So um, I wanted to start with a, a kind of broad question because you, um, you mentioned, uh, at least in passing, this idea that you, they were trying not to get folks here who would end up being impoverished and unable to return home. And it just struck me that the, um, the incidence of tuberculosis, as with most contagious illnesses, is considerably higher amongst the poor and people with fewer resources who live in crowded living conditions, et cetera. What were, I'm going to just assume there were some strategies that were used by um, the state of Colorado or its, uh, in its promotional materials and so on. How did, how did we as a state try to weed out and only bring here the people who were going to be cured and who had thick wallets. Okay, so that's a, a, a Tom may want to um, uh, jump into. That's a very complicated question. Galbraith, <laughs> um, who I quoted before, also he wrote two memoirs about his time as a TB patient, and in one he said, you know, Colorado would like likes to welcome the purses of the TB patients. They'd rather the TB patients didn't come along with the purse. So um, <laughs> there's, you know, obviously a contradiction um, and some tension right there. And as I mentioned to you, National Jewish tried to weed that out by asking patients to come with $50, a considerable sum at the time, which would ensure that they wouldn't stay, that they would be able to take a train back. Uh, one WAG um, even said, um, the way the West was settled was TB patients were sent West with a one-way ticket and a basket of fruit. So it, it, was, it was a strain on the economy. Um, and you have to remember in the early years, people didn't even realize that TB was contagious. You know, you're, um, you're talking pre-germ um, theory or at least before Koch discovers the tuberculosis bacillus in the early 1880s. And it took almost two more decades before most all doctors appreciated that that was indeed true. There was still an argument. So you're talking about decades where um, people are encouraged to come to Colorado to grow the state's population and economy. And then um, they're, they're hit with the reality, what do, what do we do um, when people A, spread TB, and what do we do with the people who can't afford it? So. Um, again, it usually was the local ethnic and religious institutions that took up the slack. So National Jewish, but I should point out National Jewish and the JCRS were the only sanatoriums that admitted all patients free of charge. Lutheran and Swedish um, had a number of charity beds, usually what they call charity beds, usually around 25%, but most of the patients were paying at least a minimal you know, a minimal amount. So yes, I mean, and, and one of the reasons that uh, Francis Jacobs was motivated was that poor people were literally um, dying on the streets. So it's, it's an old issue. And, and you're right, I, I should have mentioned at some point that um, by the, TB was no respecter of class, but by the early 20th century, it had largely become a disease of the urban poor. Were these um, institutions, uh, one of the questions we got from the audience, were these institutions um, 
largely uh, white, if you will, or did they treat also people with darker skin, whether Native American, American Indian populations, um, African American populations? I can populations. only really tell you, digging deeply in J. Saris National Jewish, that the majority of patients were Eastern European Jews, but they were both um, non-sectarian. Um, the, the race issue is very interesting because Spivak was um, a great proponent of including um, African-Americans. Uh, I don't recall seeing many in the early years as patients, but when there was a controversy about um, possibly selling um, one of the old buildings to an African-American community on the JCRS campus, he very vocally advocated for it. And in the minutes, he reminds people that both Jews and African-Americans shared um, a history of slavery. So um, there, every, every ethnic and religious group, and I would say probably even every and each racial um, group also had usually kind of cared for their own. And there was certainly not an open you know, environment for that. Um, we have joining us Bill Silvers, um, who was uh, with us for the introductions and has agreed to step in and say a couple words. I'd love to hear, Bill, from your perspective as someone with, with a long connection to National Jewish, how does this history influence contemporary practice? How does this history influence the, the culture, if you will, of National Jewish and of the Denver Jewish medical community? Well, thank you, Matt. Um, and the uh, being a graduate of uh, of the fellowship at National Jewish, um, with can you hear me? As everybody can, I can. Okay, and I'll just say, in case you didn't notice it, uh, it looks like Dr. Daly just joined us as well. So we'll we'll split this question with both of you. Excellent. So, um, well, from my perspective, um, and I know that Helen Morris we really wish to. Uh, to include in this uh, American Jewish experience in medicine, some of the history of Jewish contributions to healthcare in Colorado and nationally that, uh, that may not be recognized over the years, you know, such as uh, with Carrie, with the Children's Asthma Research Hospital. Jeannie, you gave an absolutely beautiful presentation of the history of, uh, of medicine in Colorado and, uh, uh, and its background. And I can tell you that um, it was during my fellowship, 77 to 79, that the National Asthma Center uh, merged with National Jewish to create one institution. Um, prior to that, it was the Jewish home for, uh, for the National Home for Jewish Children, Carrie. And Jeannie, you're absolutely right. It was the wealthy, uh, you know, German Jewish uh, population that supported National Jewish. And it was the, um, the, the penniless uh, Eastern Europe pop European population that helped to support Carry because I remember my parents, uh, who were Holocaust survivors, ended up in Indianapolis, Indiana. My mom always gave a few dollars to carry uh, with that kind of a relationship. I'd like to say a couple of things regarding carry. Uh, it was interesting. We just had an inaugural program of an integrative uh, allergy, immunology, respiratory wellness program at National Jewish. And the speaker, Randy Horwitz, who was the medical director of the Andrew Weil, Center for Integrative Medicine, University of Arizona, brought up the history of Cary uh, conducting some of the early research with asthma, including parentectomies. So in other words, they took the children to, to decrease the stress, considering that asthma had a neurotic uh, um, stress uh, component. They took the children from their homes, put them in the hospital, let them breathe freely outside, et cetera. And, uh, and so parentectomy, which I had forgotten about actually, was one of the, uh, the main drives for Cary early on. And then at Cary, the, there was a, a, a couple, uh, the Ishizakas, Japanese non-English speaking researchers in immunology who first discovered and described IgE, which is the sentinel immunoglobulin. And this happened on the west side of Denver at, at Cary. So National Jewish has continued to reimagine uh, itself, its mission over the years to where presently 
it had gone through a period of uh, after TB and chemotherapy, then it went into uh, heart surgery. There was heart surgery in the, in, the, in the basement, which became the pulmonary function laboratories. And now it has gone to allergy, immune deficiencies, respiratory, um, and uh, everything above the uh, everything above the pelvis, I think, is what National Jewish now uh, addresses. And um, so it, it's really become, you know, a leading respiratory center, you know, either number one or two in the country um, since they started the uh, uh, that kind of a U.S. News and World uh, rating. And uh, so I think that. National Jewish has continued to evolve. And there's something to be said for an institution over a hundred years old, continuing to, uh, you know, to contribute and to lead. And I think that this is part of uh, why Helen Morris wished to, uh, to inaugurate this program. So we remember the history where we were, so we know where we are and where we should go. So thanks very much. And Jeannie, that was absolutely wonderful. Dr. Colorado, you know, it's terrific to see you. And Dr. Daly, if you're on, it's all yours as to where we're going right now with TB and respiratory uh, mycobacterial diseases. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, barely, since we're having a power outage here at National Jewish right now. Uh, and hopefully when it comes back on, it won't burn this computer. Uh, uh, very happy to be here. Um, yeah, I, I think you, you summarize it uh, as an institution very well, because this is an institution that has been quite fluid uh, uh, in its history, uh, been able to change and evolve. And, and for me, coming here uh, from uh, UCSF many years ago uh, to a place that I looked uh, up to my entire career, uh, the TB hospital uh, and laboratory in the U.S., um, it has continued to evolve. Uh, as TB now has uh, finally shrunken in the U.S. to uh, literally record low numbers, uh, we've seen another epidemic, pandemic besides COVID, and that's these other mycobacteria. And, and again, the institution has shifted and focusing not only on TB, but also really primarily on what are called non-tuberculous mycobacteria. There are 200 species of mycobacteria now. Obviously, TB and leprosy are the most well known, but it's these others that are actually harming uh, uh, us now. And where we have less than 9,000 TB cases a year, we probably have over 100,000. Some people think over 150,000 cases of these non tuberculous mycobacteria. And they use the same laboratory. So the laboratory that opened here in the late 1800s, it still exists. It has also evolved, you know, embracing new technologies. Uh, developing new technologies. Uh, we're about to uh, uh, roll out a, a completely new molecular-based diagnostics for mycobacteria uh, that will be unique to, to National Jewish. So uh, the evolution will continue. Uh, there will be new organisms to fight, new things that we that will have to uh, chat will be challenged by. But I think there will be always be mycobacteria, and uh, and I believe National Jewish from the day it opened. Um, uh, into the far future will always be a leader uh, in mycobacterial research and clinical care, TB and other forms of uh, mycobacterial infection. So just a few thoughts about kind of where we are now and where we're going. Um, you know, one of the questions that came in um, during uh, Jeannie's presentation was around um, Serafina Pisco and Lily Morris, who were both part of the questioner's family. And she wonders um, where to find additional information on these women. Are there books or is there a good resource to learn more about some of what you covered today, Jeannie? Um, yes, I can direct you to a couple of my books. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a softball down the middle, I guess. Yes, thank you. Seraphine Pisco is one of the stars in my book on Jewish women pioneering the frontier trail of history in the American West. Lily Morris um, is not in there, but um, we do have material on Lily in the Beck archives of Rocky Mountain Jewish history at DU, including photos um, and lots and lots of material and boxes of letters that Seraphine Pisco wrote while she was the executive director. So um, people are welcome to make appointments. We're finally allowing um, visitors back into the archives post COVID. 
Um, and I'd, I'd start with the book because it, it gives a good overview. And it also talks about Fannie Lorber and Bessie Willens and Francis Weisbart Jacobs. And since, since I gave Jeannie a softball down the middle, um, Chuck, I'll, I'll send one your way as well. Um, there are maybe people on the, on the webinar today who are unaware that um, the National Jewish is the reference lab for the country um, for non-tuberculous mycobacteria and for multidrug resistant TB. And um, this, you know, before I moved here, I was at the University of Chicago and I remember many times um, packaging up a, a sample and sending it off to the National Jewish Lab because that's where you have to send things. There also may be people on the line who are unaware that we are, um, I don't know for how many years, but for a number of years, the number one um, destination for treatment of pulmonary TB um, and non, uh, and non-tuberculous mycobacteria um, for, I don't know, generations, uh, 20, 30, 40 years. I, I'm not actually sure how long. Um, and we routinely rank number one in the country for pulmonary medicine across the board um, in the US News and World Reports. And that is a legacy in some ways, I guess, of, of this history. So the softball question is, what do you think is the role of National Jewish in that sort of top tier, you know, US News and World Reports ranking every year? How important is this legacy to our to our you know ongoing success in this arena? Well, National Jewish again. I mean, I use the word uh, fluid. It's always been a, a smallish institution compared to some other medical uh, institutions, but that's good because it allows us to turn quickly. Uh, COVID was a very good example. Uh, we we basically as an institution just turned on a dime uh, and had. PCR up and running with 24, 48 hour turnaround within about two weeks. Uh, vaccine set up in the parking lot, thousands a weekend. So, I mean, that was, that's just an example of what's kind of happened probably throughout its history. So as TB started declining, um, well, our, our clinics started being filled with these other, other patients. They were just as complex as MDR TB. Uh, they're mycobacteria, we use the same laboratory. And so I think it was just a natural evolution on the TB side. But as an institution, you know, this is an amazing place. I mean, it really is. I, I've worked at some incredible institutions, but I, I always said when I came here, this was a place that you, you just don't say no. Uh, it, it's a collegial place. If I need something, people will help me. If I need a test, they will help me get it. Um, and I think it's that we don't say no, we keep trying, uh, we think outside the box. Um, it, it keeps us at the top, uh, and, I, and I hope we can maintain that culture here because I do think it's the culture uh, that allows us to maintain that kind of preeminence in pulmonary medicine and, of course, in my area, in mycobacterial disease. Um, Tom, I feel like I should give you one as well that, uh, that I'm sure you will have a long answer to, but can you say a little bit about the Panic of 1893? Um, this was raised uh, in Jeannie's talk as the reason why the original building remained at vacant for a few years. What, what was the panic of 1893? Well, Colorado had been booming ever since the initial gold rush and the arrival of the railroads. Then all of a sudden in 1893, the federal government no longer purchases silver at a subsidized price. So silver, the leading industry at that point in Colorado, the silver mines closed, the smelters closed, the law firms all these people connected with uh, silver. So for the first time, Colorado begins losing uh, population there. And it's detrimental, to, obviously, as we just heard, the National Jewish gets postponed for, what, nine years. Uh, it's a good example of the boom and bust cycle in Colorado. And in looking at these booms, about the only thing that doesn't bust is medicine. Uh, medicine and healthcare seems to keep on booming, and I think National Jewish plays a huge role there in putting us on a national map, as, as you were saying, for uh, healthcare. And that has never gone down, and so we all age and whatnot, it's going to continue to be a boom with the National Jewish and at the forefront. Helen, I see that you've raised your hand, um, and if you would like to turn on your camera and your microphone, 
I would welcome a question from you. And in the meantime, um, I'm gonna ask a question for whoever can answer it, if anyone. Um, I live in the Montclair neighborhood uh, of Denver and the Montclair Civic Center is uh, in, a, in a park near my home. And this park, um, the Civic Center is, uh, was part of the Baron von Richthofen's um, estate at one point and then became a TB sanitarium. And I was told it's built as it is because it, they wanted the fumes from the goats and pigs and sheep and horses and cattle living below the house to permeate up into the house and through the, um, and through the house and that that was supposed to drive out the tuberculosis. Um, so people lived upstairs and cattle and horses lived downstairs. And the whole thing is in kind of a little bit of an indent in the earth. So you can only imagine on a nice hot summer day, um, sitting out on that porch would have been incredibly pungent. And um, I'm wondering, you know, that's a wonderful story. Uh, is there any truth to it? Yes, man. I live in Montclair too. I've written a book on that very topic. Um, oh my gosh. Called or milk house, <laughs> and and you're right about that. Uh, Baron von Richthofen, after the crash of '93, he can't sell real estate, so he's trying to sell health care there, and stables his prize-winning Jersey cattle down below, and pages, as you said, were up there on those sun porches where you had a clear view of the mountains for which Montclair is named, and breathe in that fresh air, and not only drink, breathe the fumes, but also drink the milk right out of the cow's tent, which today physicians cringe at. That was supposed to help you. And then through those grates, that barnyard effluvium, as the Baron put it, would be a sure cure. I don't think it was two years later that place is converted to an insane asylum. It doesn't last long because people in the neighborhood didn't like screaming people running around in the middle of the night. And it becomes the first civic center, neighborhood center in Denver about 1909 when the city acquires the property as part of the Montclair Park. Matt, if I can pitch in here also, I might say that they were early on in this kind of an association of uh, the cows and, uh, and the animals um, closely cohabiting with people because the whole hygiene hypothesis actually has been revisited over the last few years to where in, uh, in non-industrialized societies where you have the animals living in tents with dirt floors with people, you have less allergy and allergic reactivity because their immune system has been more stimulated, et cetera. And as we become with airtight buildings, et cetera, we have a greater um, prevalence of, uh, of allergic reactivity. So this whole um, concept, I mean, they were early on, I suppose, with the Richthofen's and uh, uh, the sane and insane, you know, uh, approaches to, uh, to healthcare. But the whole hy hygiene hypothesis, and that's been worked on actually recently at National Jewish also. It was actually initially described by one of the, well, by one of the graduates of National Jewish, Mark Holbreich, who was looking at the Amish community in Northern Indiana and seeing a low pre prevalence of allergic reactivity. Why? because the Amish were living in close proximity with their, uh, with their farm animals. And mm -hmm. so that's, uh, that's continued forth. So it's interesting how, the, how discoveries are made. <laughs> um, if I can jump in on a little different topic, back to what Bill was saying about the parentectomy that was um, uh -huh. instituted at um, the asthma center. Um, as I said, children were um, removed from their home environment, their parents, and lived at, um, and I see between, usually it was about a year and a half. And that doesn't um, imply that the, they were being raised by, what shall I say, a bad parents or ineffective parents. Um, I think Helen, if she can come in, will testify to this too. Um, children who had extreme cases of asthma it was a very frightening existence, and it was kind of a cycle of anxiety. So children, as I said, were afraid to eat certain foods that might cause an allergic reaction. They were afraid of go outside and play, afraid of exercise. 
So all of those things um, made the parents also exceptionally overprotective and uh, and maybe justifiably so. And, uh, the idea was that taking them out of their environment. I can't. It sounds like Helen is trying to join us, but she may be logged on twice, and so we're getting a lot of feedback. Um, while we're waiting for her uh, to uh, to to get the sound issue resolved, how did um, sufferers of tuberculosis elsewhere in the country learn about what was going on in Denver? And were there were the did National Jewish advertise, um, or was this mostly word of mouth? Um, to get people here from, say, the East Coast? First of there all, are a lot of works, uh, Jeannie can add to this too, by prominent physicians like Dr. Dennison advocating Colorado as the climate cure. So it was well published in the literature and magazine articles and whatnot. Yes, mm -hmm. and, there, and there was um, a, really a debate of whether it was better to send people west or stay in their home environment. There were um, sanatoriums in other parts of the country in, you know, on the East Coast, um, in California and Arizona. So um, in, in Colorado, because of its exceptional, um, you know, altitude, uh, the dry air, those were thought to be um, especially healthy, especially as, as Tom said, like Dr. Dennison and some of the people who were advocates for what they call climatology um, treatment. Um, and it was by word of mouth. Um, National Jewish and JCRS um, may have disagreed over um, points of treatment, et cetera, et cetera, but there were more than enough patients to go around in both uh, for both of those sanatoriums. And that was largely through the Jewish community, particularly for JCRS. There was almost a feeder line between the workmen's circles, organizations around the country, and um, they would recommend somebody um, from their constituency and often provide at least enough funds to get the patients out here. So it was a combination of very conscious PR, um, medical, some physicians who really in Colorado were advocating for it and getting that message out around the country and people who really came here as their last resort. Major promoter, Jeannie showed it in her first slide, were the railroads. Yeah. West for your health. I had I had that exact thought when I, when I saw that. Of course, the railroads, and they presumably don't care if you um, can buy a return ticket as long as they can sell you one ticket, they'll be happy. Um, that was what that was actually what sparked my initial question about. So how do you when you've got the railroads trying to sell as many tickets as they can? How do you uh, weed out, if you will, the, the, the undesirables who don't have the thick wallets? Um, Chuck, and I want to- some, some of those undesirables, by the way, were the ones who were told to wear bells so that you would hear them coming and stay out of their way and not let them spit on you. <laughs> um, Chuck, I wonder if you would say a word about um, the evolution of treatment, because we've heard several times here that uh, raw eggs, uh, raw milk, even straight from the teat of a cow, um, which I have to say as an infectious disease guy, when I hear that, I think mycobacterium bovis, <laughs> which, which is one of the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, when, when did we stop telling people to drink raw milk and eat raw eggs as a treatment for TB? Uh, hopefully when we got antimicrobials, uh, because up until <laughs> up until that point, we didn't have anything else, you know, to really to offer. And if you looked at a lot and you'll see some of the pictures, they were many of the patients were quite malnourished. And we do know that uh, you, even now with non tuberculous mycobacteria, that when people's body mass index falls below around 18.5, they have a higher risk of progression of disease. So clearly, you know, being malnourished uh, in a setting of mycobacterial infection is a bad thing. And many people think that that was one of the main, uh, actually, interventions uh, that helped people with TB at the sanatoria was, was they got food. They got highly nutritious, mm -hmm. uh, high protein food. Um, but we do not recommend that anymore as far as that specific diet, uh, raw eggs and, and milk. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I want to echo what Chuck said. Tuberculosis was considered a wasting disease is what they called it because so many people um, you know, lost weight. And so the eggs and the milk and meat were really aimed at what they considered fattening up the patient. And I think they had a positive effect in the sense it probably boosted their immune system. Uh, Chuck you know, is the medical expert, I'm just the historian, but um, it probably did help them in general um, to be able to recover, you know, the body kind of healing itself on some level, because we know it didn't get cured by eggs or milk or, or meat, but at least it, it helped stabilize them. If I can, uh, if I can pitch in here, and I see that Helen just got on the video, so we'll hear from her in a few minutes, I hope. But regarding the tools that we have in our quiver over the years, nutrition was one of the, 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 the few tools that we really had. And if we look back in history, Maimonides, uh, who had written the first treatise on asthma in the 12th century, um, in his treatise on asthma, he concentrated on diet, on how one could um, help in terms of uh, one's own reg moderation of lifestyle and nutritional input. And he spoke about specific foods, et cetera. So when we're talking about milk and eggs, you know, we're talking about the 12th century to the 20th century that before modern biochemistry and pharmacology, you know, we had to really keep with the basics. And I think that, especially for example, with Maimonides treatise on asthma, you know, he dealt with nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep, lifestyle. And these are things that in a holistic integrative approach, you know, are modalities that we still, that we still use a lot. I see Helen on the, on uh, the panelists. Helen, Matt, take it away here. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Ah, uh, I, you know, I've just had technical problems. I've been able to hear this program. And of course, Jeannie, it was just a marvelous, marvelous uh, presentation. Um, um, well, I've had the benefit of um, actually observing most of the change that has occurred from, um, um, from the time of uh, Carrie, I, I did some research at Carrie uh, from the time uh, uh, that that Carrie was in operation all the way through the trend toward the change to the National Asthma Center and to the development of um, uh, National Jewish as the center uh, for identification and. Uh, presumably, hopefully, in the future, treatment of non tuberculosis uh, mycobacteria. So that this is an evolution um, that has uh, that I've had the benefit of observing. Um, I'd like to make a couple of uh, comments. Just to follow up on Bill's um, um, uh, statement about nutrition and exercise and so on. Um, I saw a quote um, attributed to Maimonides, and he said that if people took care of themselves and the way that they take care of their animals, we would all be much help, healthier. That for animals, we try to find the right food and because we want the animal to stay uh, healthy. Um, but for ourselves, we do whatever we darn please and do not necessarily <laughs> follow the best uh, uh, health benefits. Um, um, but I'd like to make just a comment about um, uh, the evolution of um, uh, picking up patients whose parents were uh, victims of tuberculosis. And as TB became, uh, came under treatment, it was less uh, as antibiotic treatment became available uh, for tuberculosis, uh, there was less need for, uh, a, a TB began to be treated as an outpatient. Uh, 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 illness and by the and there was less need for sanatoria, um, and so 
many of the patients uh, with TB were able to resume care of their own children, but um, the children home for Jewish children had the facilities and had um, and had a program for taking care of children. And so this evolved then as they were looking around for what to do with their facility, they actually even took to birth, um, uh, some children with, um, um, with juvenile delinquency. And uh, these were first offenders and the children in this environment did very well. And that evolved into the first juvenile court system, one of the very first juvenile court systems um, in Colorado um, and in nationally. Um, um, but that was not their primary mission. And that evolved then into taking children with asthma um, who were sent to Denver um, for a trial. These were children from all over the country who were suffering from severe asthma. And uh, children were sent here with the idea that if the child did well, the parent might consider relocating the family to Denver. And of course, a very large number of uh, families did just that. As the children did well, the family relocated here. But initially, um, children were sent here simply uh, for trial, and there were no medical facilities as such uh, to take care of these patients. Uh, um, but this then evolved into a hospital and treatment center uh, uh, for the children. And, so, and uh, because uh, doctors and staff were able to watch children, um, a great deal was learned about the progress of asthma. Asthma otherwise was treated sporadically. It was treated when the child uh, appeared with severe illness, um, but in a setting such as Carrie, it was possible to monitor pulmonary function on a regular basis to watch the evolution of an attack to see how it was possible to intervene at an appropriate moment and to prevent a severe attack. Uh, and so a great deal was learned clinically about the care of patients with asthma. And um, um, as Bill mentioned, in addition to that, there was some research going on, uh, some of it being very innovative. The uh, identification of IgE, for example, was one of the big milestones um, in, in the evolution of asthma uh, understanding and treatment. Um, but I would hope um, that we could hear more about the move toward um, identification uh, by National Jewish uh, Hospital uh, of patients with variants of uh, uh, the mycobacteria and the treatment uh, uh, that began to appear um, when patients with AIDS um, uh, were suffer came in with uh, tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And this was, uh, and, and the recognition that we were often dealing with a, um, a different uh, form of, of tuberculosis. Um, and, and, and again, there were a number of pioneers in that um, uh, in that field that were located uh, national Jewish and that have subsequently evolved into making this a national um, uh, national center in this field. I wonder if you could speak about that. Chuck, um, I think that's for you. Yeah. So, um... I think I think if I understood the the, the question, it's really uh, um, uh, how how did we get to to this position in the non tuberculous mycobacterial uh, yes. area? How we uh, how we evolved from TB? Jennifer and then with Dr. Heifetz and so right on. right yeah so so Dr. Heifetz, Leonid Heifetz, who ran our uh, mycobacterial reference uh, 
lab for decades and was really an internationally recognized uh, microbiologist and uh, TB expert. He's the one who ushered us from kind of one era to the next, which was an era in which most everything that came to the lab was tuberculosis, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, to the time when most things that were coming to the lab were now transitioning and it was non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So he had to figure out how to make that transition, how to improve the agar so that you could really isolate many, many different types of species. And it's, it's a bit different than tuberculosis. Also with uh, the therapies that we're developing for the non-tuberculous mycobacteria, he had to develop ways to do drug susceptibility testing. This remains today a tremendous challenge, uh, one that he pretty much helped set uh, uh, in motion. And as you said, you know, the, this issue of NTM really came on the scene during AIDS. When AIDS started, we were seeing patients with consumption again. Uh, they were just disappearing before our eyes, but it wasn't TB all the time. It was usually mycobacterium avium complex. And, and from that point on, we really started to switch and focus so much more on NTM, uh, at least here in the U.S. And, and I would like to put out a, a thank you to Dr. Heifetz for all that he did to, to usher us through that incredible few decades. You know, I, I think one thing I want to make sure people know today is when, when National Jewish Open, we were using a sanatory approach, good nutrition, sunshine. Um, and then we eventually evolved and got streptomycin and PAS and uh, rifampin and other drugs and were able to cure tuberculosis with 90, 95% cure rates. Uh, but it still took a long time to do it. And today you should know that uh, we have a, a regimen that can cure tuberculosis and it's only four months long. And it's all oral drugs. Um, we can now prevent tuberculosis with one month treatment regimen and those people who have a positive skin test. So there's been dramatic changes over time and, and, and I'm very happy to, to have been here at National Jewish and, and worked with many of the people who helped develop and, and guide the development of, of those regimens and drugs. So um, I, I think that you're gonna see just remarkable things in this field uh, in the near future uh, to where we're curing our patients now with very short all oral regimens. A map well, before we finish, uh, perhaps I can just give a little vignette about Leonid Heifetz. He uh, came from the former Soviet Union in around 1977, 78 to National Jewish because I was in my fellowship then, not knowing a word of English or not too many. He had corresponded with one of the researchers at National Jewish Mayor who, um, and he had written at the end of his letter, he did a little sign that looked kind of like a shalom. And this is when the Iron Curtain was such that you could not have communication. And Mayer picked up on it and said, I think he's trying to tell me something. And from that little vignette, I mean, he explored and he was able to get Leonid Heifetz to come working with Mike Eisenman and, and reinvented, reinvigorated the whole program of National Jewish. So as the Iron Curtain, unfortunately, in our political era today, looks like it's descending a bit. Let's uh, use this as an example for how we really need to uh, go for democracy and communication and humanitarian you know, efforts toward our fellow man. So that's just a little history. Well, I think I still have a half a dozen. I started with a half a dozen questions. Now I have a half a dozen new questions, which is what we promised at the beginning, that we would tease you with a lot of information and there will be future programs to explore um, additional questions. I really want to hear about, you know, how did uh, how, how did it come to pass that two women founded this hospital and were so incredibly successful in an area that is not exactly an era that was not exactly known for, you know, women taking on leadership roles in the healthcare system. Uh, what is it about the Jewish faith that leads the so many Jewish communities and, and individuals and organizations to become so involved in the healthcare system? Um, and I think these are the kinds of questions they've been raised today. We'll get a chance um, to explore those in the future. 
Um, I want to thank everyone for being with us today. Um, I want to remind you that um, we will have uh, another program on the history of uh, medica medicine, uh, specifically the history of healthcare's involvement in the Holocaust and the ways in which that continues, that legacy continues to affect bioethics um, and, uh, and the delivery of health services today. Um, and that will take place during the week of remembrance of the victims of the Holocaust, April 25th through 27th. Keep an eye on your email for notices about that program. And this year, that program will also include a component that is from this program, the American Jewish Experience in Medicine. We'll be doing a program on medical racism, the American Jewish Experience on April 25th. That'll be at noon again, check out the website or just keep an eye on your email and we'll try and get everyone a notice about that. Thank you all for being with us today and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next event.